this is Ganguly, Naveen Jindal, Mr. Bora, Vice Chancellor Rajkumar, Mr. Sapru, and of course, today's star, the author, Sri Ram Cholia. Excellencies, distinguished diplomats in the audience, ladies and gentlemen, friends, I hope that covers everybody. I think you can see that the difficulty in unwrapping the book is itself a measure of the difficulty of the subject that the author today has chosen to tackle. He's taken an extremely important and complex area, one which has not, in fact, been extensively studied or written about, and he has produced a very impressive book that we are now privileged to release to you all today. The entire question of the protection of civilians by international organizations in the midst of ongoing humanitarian catastrophes is something that I've myself had the dubious privilege of being intimately involved with in the course of my own UN career. So in some respects, when Sriram Chole asked if I would do this, I must say that I felt I had no choice but to respond with a positive answer, because it is a subject which could benefit from the kind of hands-on scholarship that Dr. Cholia has brought to bear on this subject. Uh, he has actually worked in the field in two countries, caught up in different but uh, comparable cases of civil conflict, Sri Lanka and the Philippines. He has worked as a volunteer with or an employee of uh, an international non-governmental organization, but he has been able to see at first hand and at close quarters the workings of the international governmental organizations active in the same territory. He's been able to talk to volunteers, to workers, to soldiers, and above all, to civilian victims affected by these conflicts. And as a result, his is very much a first-hand account, informed, and I think you will see this in the passion with which he writes, informed by his own personal and very subjective commitment to the injustices he's seen around him being overcome. At the same time, this is a work of scholarship. He could have written with the same amount of field experience an anecdotal or journalistic book. He has chosen not to do so. I understand the origins of this book lie in a dissertation for a PhD or for a doctorate. And uh, therefore, it is uh, uh, the, 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 the same material that a journalist might use for a headline story has been used here as field research. And there is a strong theoretical framework imposed upon it which the academics in this hall, I'm sure, would particularly appreciate. Uh, I will not address that. I, my own PhD is now too many decades ago for me to, uh, to comment on the, the academic rigor with which he has approached his work, but it seems to me apparent uh, from a cursory glance at the theoretical uh, framework within which he's addressed these questions. And, of course, we've heard from Vice Chancellor Rajkumar about the the praise that his work has already garnered from academic experts. So I think we need not doubt that this is a book that students can read with profit. I would instead perhaps address the substance of the issues he's tried to tackle. Because um, uh, though he has studied very closely these two situations, and he's seen a number of organizations at work, uh, he didn't have an opportunity to work alongside or write about the organization that I served in which most directly has a formal responsibility for civilian protection embedded in its mandate, and that is the organization called the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, an organization I served for 11 years, 11 and a half years, before spending another seven years in international peacekeeping for the UN. So I've seen some of this, and I'm alive to the dilemmas that Sri Ram Chaudhya has, through these case studies, sought so effectively to explicate. One of the great challenges, of course, is the entire notion of humanitarianism. Uh, it comes at one level out of a simple, basic human impulse. Any of us, when seeing human beings in distress, are confronted with the daily choice, how do we respond? Do we ignore and walk past? Do we act? And if so, what are the implications of our actions? Can we make a difference through our actions? Might we affect, through our actions, a more sensible solution. You face this kind of dilemma when you're confronted by a beggar at a traffic light in Delhi. And then you are asking yourself, should I just ignore and pretend to be reading my newspaper? 
Should I give some money, and if I do, will 10 other beggars come and block my car? On the other hand, if I give my money, is that money going to end up in the hand of some sort of gang master who has maimed this child and sent him out to beg? Am I, in fact, impeding a more fundamental solution in our society that might make it unnecessary for people to beg? Am I, in fact, sustaining an evil practice by my act of humanitarian charity? All of these are questions that we as individuals are literally facing every day on the streets of our city. And if you magnify these questions a millionfold, you see them faced in the challenge of humanitarian action on the international level. So you're looking at tragedies occurring around the world, tragedies caused by poverty and suffering, tragedies caused by underdevelopment, a word that is no longer in fashion, tragedies caused by conflict and civil war, and tragedies caused by deliberate actions of governments to violate human rights in pursuit of their own objectives. And the question arises, do we respond, and if so, how? And as you know, the, the great statesman who founded the international system at the end of the Second World War, who saw the horrors of the, the first four and a half decades of the 20th century, saw the, the, the tragedies of, uh, of countless expulsions of human beings in various conflicts, civil wars, wars between nations, and then ultimately the horrors of the Holocaust and Hiroshima. Those statesmen said never again, and they tried to create a world in which, yes, we would be our brother's keepers, where we would try and prevent conflict, and when it occurred, we would try and provide succor for its victims. And out of that was born the humanitarian machinery that uh, in one version, in one aspect of it, Sri Ram Cholia has seen in Sri Lanka and the Philippines. And that humanitarian machinery was set up very specifically to deal with the consequences of these human horrors while not worrying about the political beneficiaries or implications thereof. Nonetheless, because for the longest time, much of the aid that came into this international system came from Western countries. And many of the beneficiaries, arguably most of the beneficiaries, until the, until the Yugoslav civil war, were non-European, non-white people in what was called the third world, suffering from deficiencies of their own governance structures and their own inability to keep the peace amongst themselves. Humanitarianism got caught up in a certain notion of Western involvement in the eastern or southern parts of the world, and that too carried with it a certain uh, political connotation that has been resisted by some analysts, but uh, challenged uh, all too infrequently by others. Add to this the undoubted human generosity of the individuals out there on the front lines. It didn't matter if the humanitarian aid worker uh, came from a particular part of the world or, or had a particular passport. He was giving up the comforts of his home life, or she was, very often there's some fine female workers in the field, after all, to better the lot of people with whom they had no personal interest or connection. And that, I think, is also underestimated sometimes at our peril. If we are, if we are going to take a, a purely ideological construct and see humanitarian action as some sort of emanation of Western political interests, uh, we forget the human beings who are performing the humanitarian actions ultimately on the ground. And of course the international organizations very often did engage people from other parts of the world uh, so that you could either cynically say they were instruments of a Western agenda or you could say that they were a genuine attempt by the international system to internationalize, if you like, the delivery of humanitarian services. And these issues, these questions, were questions one lived with all the time. I worked in an organization uh, where, indeed, people of my color of skin and darker were, were a minority amongst the staff, where much of the decisions and 90% and or more of the funding came from countries uh, of uh, the global north. And I'm sure that remains true and perhaps even more true for the non-governmental organizations, where, indeed, they represent in many ways the institutionalization of the compassion of the affluent. That is indeed something that, that we have to face. And the organization that Sri Ram Chaudhya is studying in his book, 
are organizations coming from that sort of background. There are two UN agencies he refers to, UNDP and UNICEF. Uh, but UNDP has principally a development mandate. UNICEF has principally a child, child welfare, including child protection mandate. The only organization in the UN system with a formal legal mandate, both in its statute, which comes out of a GA resolution, and out of the conventions and protocols undergirding it, is UNHCR. And that was not studied. So there is one, perhaps, uh, omission that relates to, after all, the countries in which Dr. Chaudhary was doing his, his research. But some of the broader questions he raises are very important and deserve to be studied, deserve to be analyzed, even by those whose concerns have involved working with other organizations. For example, his suggestion that uh, those who are engaged with humanitarian operations are often people from whom civilians need protection rather than those who are giving protection themselves. Or is concerned that in many cases um, the uh, prevalence of gender exploitation in many of these uh, humanitarian operations reflects the traditional um, debasement and exploitation of women in conflict situations around the world. Uh, some of these issues are important, and I think they would merit very serious understanding uh, by those whose task it is to do this kind of work. I would say that the, the, the uh, limitations are greater where there isn't a, um, a legal framework, uh, such as the one that UNHCR had, because a non-governmental organization does indeed reflect the goodwill and the kindness of heart of its donors and its leaders, but it has no legal framework. It operates in a country on the sufferance of the authorities of that country. And that automatically limits its freedom or its ability to protect in a very real sense. Because protection ultimately requires the force of the law. And if the law is on the side of the governmental authorities of the country in which you're operating, then in that case, you operate within the limits and parameters that the law allows you to operate. UN organizations, because they have a certain supranational quality and often emerge from um, uh, intergovernmental agreements, uh, they're in a slightly better position. And there's no question that a UN representative who's come with an agreement uh, given to him by the host government is often in a position to speak directly to the government at a level and with, a, with an authority that no NGO representative is ever able to do. And that is something that someone like Sri Ram, who worked only within the NGO context, uh, would obviously have, not, have only seen from one particular side. Very often the UN, because it is made up of governments, uh, often plays a curious double role in that its public pronouncements are often pablum, uh, designed not to publicly antagonize the government to which it is accredited or with, 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 which it's, with whom it's working. But the same representative who says all this blah, this bland stuff outside, may behind closed doors be speaking bluntly, even harshly, in terms that he's not at liberty to reveal outside. I've been in that position myself. So I can tell you that uh, sometimes it is too easy to judge harshly the limitations and failures of um, a UN representative in a conflict situation. But these are all tangential observations. The central merit of Siran Chalia's book is that he has taken a broad subject, one which has had very little academic work and even less serious study at book length. There is, n there is not very much out there uh, in the literature about humanitarianism. I would commend to you a book by my friend David Reef called A Bed in the Night as a more general interest sort of book about the central dilemmas of humanitarianism. But in the academic field, I suspect that this book that we have had the pleasure of launching today may well turn out to set a new standard in its field. And I do hope that all of you who are here and have taken interest in this subject will look into the questions that he has raised that I've attempted broadly to sketch in my brief remarks and that you will go into this with the kind of uh, rigor and intellectual seriousness that Dr. Cholia has brought to these questions. So I wish you all success as an author, as a scholar, and of course, in particular, the success of this book and the many more that I'm sure are to follow from your pen. Thank you all for listening to me. Jay.